Hi, uh, so thank you, welcome everyone who's joining this live Zoom call. Uh, good, uh, depending on where in the world you are, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. Uh, so, having said that, something I think we don't like to know is since we're on the subject of ethical fashion, ethical living, uh, fair trade, uh, tell us, uh, like, uh, what are you wearing, what's the brand, uh, is it organic, cotton, is it uh, fair trade, uh, and what are you having, like your drink, and like this is, uh, are you having coffee? Uh, so is it uh, so just just let us know because we'd love to hear um, uh, just uh, use the chat uh, function and uh, just just type in and uh, we'd love you to share your thoughts uh, so I'd like to welcome our speakers we have Safia Bidi uh, the founder of People Tree uh, one of the very first fair trade organizations and she's one of the leading advocates speakers uh, on fair trade, social enterprise, uh, social entrepreneurship. Uh, then we have Erich, who is the CEO of the uh, World Fair Trade Organization. Uh, we have Selina Pires from Celine, uh, Sri Lanka's one and only fair trade guaranteed handloom manufacturer. Uh, Lenali from House of Lenali. Uh, they specialize, uh, she's the founder and uh, lead designer, and specializing in. Uh, sustainable design, um, waste, uh, upcycle designing, and then there's myself, Vikram, from Cantela. Uh, we work with uh, traditional craftsmen, traditional artisans, uh, and we make vegan handbags. Um, so, first of all, uh, just uh, to let um, I think everyone knows today is World Labor Day. Um, and it's a day to celebrate uh, the workers, the people, the labor uh, that really is driving the economy, driving the world. And I think uh, more than ever before, uh, COVID has kind of uh, put into perspective the, uh, the importance, the significance of their contribution to our economy, to our everyday lives. Um, and also to uh, just um, um, before we start off, because we asked a few questions, we uh, had a couple of questions in the registration form, uh, and I'm pretty sure everyone's quite interested to know uh, how everyone kind of picked those, uh, and if everyone else is thinking along the same lines. So the first question we asked was, do you work in a fair trade, social, or an ethical enterprise? 75% said they yes, and uh, 25% said no, and I think that's really, I mean, that's absolutely great because uh, this is a conversation that we want to have with people uh, who are outside of the fair trade social enterprise network. Uh, the second question we asked was for you to pick the three most important issue out of a set, and the one that was selected at the top was uh, sustainable product design and development. Second was impact of business activities on the environment and communities. Third was business transparency. Uh, fourth was responsible consumer decision making. Uh, fifth was impact of consumer behavior on the environment and communities. Uh, sixth, we had uh, welfare and rights of workers. Uh, seventh, lack of ethical options in the market. And the final one was fair tax policy for equitable growth. Um, and yes, I mean, now in terms of uh, talking about uh, the way we work, transparency, welfare of workers, um, it's, it's kind of, it's important to note that uh, global brands, large fashion brands, uh, so far since the start of COVID, have cancelled somewhere between three to five billion dollars worth of orders which had all they placed are finished are ready to ship from countries like Sri Lanka Bangladesh Cambodia Myanmar and that's causing a lot of factories to close down because these products have been made the costs have been incurred uh, and uh, as these factories shut down factory workers are being uh, uh, sent back home without maybe their salaries for March, uh, without any severance pay. And it's very important to note that possibly about 80-85% or more uh, of the workers in the fashion industry, in the garments, are women who are, most of, who are part of the vulnerable community. 
Uh, so this kind of puts into perspective how while these large brands are struggling, uh, how social enterprises, fair trade enterprises have made a commitment uh, to look after uh, their workers, their employees, without uh, without uh, sacrificing them. And I mean, just I, that's where at even at uh, Cantilla, we made a very conscious decision from the very start that the way we structure our business is going to be with a very small overhead, a very small center, because our, our priority is to make sure that our artisans, our rural communities uh, get most of the benefit. So that, to a greater degree, has helped us to uh, to make sure that at the center that we can take a pay cut, but make sure that our artisans are looked after, uh, that we are sending them a food package, which is done in consultation with our chief artisans, and a financial handout, a cash handout, just to make sure that they are safe, they're protected until we can make it to the other side of, co uh, of this epidemic. Uh, but we, as I said, are structured in a very, uh, in a very different way. Where is uh, uh, Celine, uh, which is which has been around for, uh, since the early late nineteen eighties. I mean, that's um, as as old as I am, and uh, so uh, the, their structures are different. So it's it's very it's very interesting. Uh, Celine, if you can share your thoughts of how. Uh, Celine, uh, because I know you have a network of about three to five hundred workers, employees in your in your network. Uh, how are you looking after them during? And we were saying, what are we going to do? Because we have no idea when this is going to end, how this is going to turn out. And being a kind of a luxury, more luxury brand, we weren't sure how people would even react to buying um, our products after this was all to end. So um, the biggest consideration was our people. We couldn't, we just couldn't, um, we just couldn't take the decision to lay people off. We just couldn't take the decision at the, in the middle of March to tell people, you know, we are going to cut your salaries. Because they, I mean, it's, it was hitting them as much as it was hitting us, right? So I remember my mom saying, look, this, is why this is crisis and if we are not there for our people at this time really who are we and why have we done what we've done so march we paid our salaries and allowances in full which took a massive hit on our um kind of financial statements because there was no income after that point and we could see export orders were getting postponed at least we were lucky enough not to have a lot of them cancelled uh, and i think that's part of being the, in the fair trade network and um, come April, we were like, okay, what are we going to do? And, but even before we started any of the pivoting that we've done right now, we are making fabric masks, which is allowing us to keep our employees uh, paid and on the payroll and really working at this time. We had made a decision. We were not going to lay anyone off. That leadership came from the very top and said, absolutely not. No one was going home. And we just, you know, made that decision. <laughs> and two weeks later, started making the fabric face masks. Um, I mean, I'm not saying there's a business decision behind the decision not to lay anyone off, but I think that's the difference our businesses um, have. Not everything makes business sense, but it will make business sense. So when you make that tough call, you then start becoming creative to meet the challenges that Tough Call has um, given to us. So that is the difference of being a social enterprise and a fair trade business, is that you keep your values first and then the creativity comes to meet the challenges afterwards. So yeah, um, just to sum it all up, uh, April is over. We are very happy to be paying our staff and uh, which is um, close to, uh, we employed directly 300. We have sewing people up to about 200 more home workers. And we are elated that because of the demand, the fabric face mask or the people's mask, an initiative by the World Fair Trade Organization um, has given us, we've also been able to give work to other smaller garment units in our district, um, which is absolutely fantastic. So um, yeah, that's 
that's kind of our journey uh, in this period of how we approach things to protect our employees. Just put them first, basically. And um, so I think now, arrange, uh, especially because we are part of the World Satellite Organization Network, uh, and the whole idea of the people's mask and everything that you guys have been doing, the stay home, live fair campaign. I'm sure so many others in the network too have amazing success stories of how they have managed to keep their employees together during these difficult times. Would it be, um, I mean, it would be great if you can share that with our uh, audience. Yeah, thank you, Selena. And I think um, Selin is, is, is an example of the kind of enterprises that, that are in, in this community of enterprises around the world anyway. So the World Fair Trade Organization um, has got members in more than 76 countries. Uh, the majority of businesses like Selin, so there are 361 that are like Selin that are, you know, fair trade enterprises that have set themselves up with a with the priority of putting people first and planet first in the way they operate. Um, of those 240 have achieved sort of guaranteed status, which we sell in as one of, uh, which demonstrates that they fully comply holistically to the 10 principles of fair trade. So that, that's a little bit of uh, the background of, of who this community is, how it's been set up and how they behave. And the, the anecdotes, I think, are broad and are varied, but there's something in common, which is that it, all of them in a time of crisis are deciding what their priorities are and their priorities are always their communities and the people who make the products that they eventually sell. When you start with that as a priority, you don't start with a spreadsheet. You don't start with how do I crunch the numbers to minimize my, my costs? How many, you know, producers do I need to let go? How, who do, how do I cut and run from my community or my, my producer groups or workers? When, when, when that's not your starting point, then a whole different world I think becomes becomes possible and uh and for our for our members i mean a lot of them are relying on those long-term relationships of solidarity you know you mentioned for instance Celine, that you've been lucky that those or orders hadn't been cancelled um if you look at the mainstream market the orders have been cancelled and without a second thought and without a pause you know and, and they were cancelled very early on but in the in the fair trade world and uh, who, you know, with businesses that operate with mission primacy, they don't cancel those. They say, look, let's, let's make it work one way or another. Let's give you as much certainty as possible. Um, and those businesses that you're working with are also our, our, our members who are in Europe or North America, and they're, they're suffering. So they're, they're unable to um, you know, uh, reach, uh, get products from their warehouses to the shops because the shops aren't ordering and the shops aren't selling at the moment. You know, they're, they're experiencing that pain as well, but are deciding to stick by you the same way you're deciding to stick by your workers, you know, and, and that, that sort of chain has continued. The innovations have happened, you know, on things such as PPEs and, and mask production, uh, which, which has been an amazing ground up kind of approach, grassroots approach. Um, our colleagues in WFTO Asia have really led that approach and, and have been pivotal to it, but it's, it's really relied on that connection and solidarity and trust that exists within that network of businesses. Uh, I think on, on the web shops front as well, there's been a real flurry of activity with um, members trying to set up web shops so they can at least get some orders in during this period, connect with consumers who are more likely to, um, to shop online during this period. Um, huge logistical and supply chain challenges there, but there have been innovations, including let's take an order now, but deliver later, you know, so that there's at least some cash flow in and, and there's an opportunity for consumers to show solidarity. But I think all in all, what this, what the crisis really does is separate the wheat from the chaff. It allows the public, consumers, everyone, citizens to, to really see that you know, what is the end priority of that business? Are they working to maximize profits and make every decision with how do I accumulate as much profit as possible? How do I minimize my costs? How do I make my margins as big as possible? Or are they saying, I'm trying to run a viable business, but always the priority is people and planet. And I will make it work just like you did. You decide on your priority, you put that stake in the ground and then said, we'll, we'll now make, take the decisions that will make this our focus and this reality. You know, examples from Latin America, from East Africa, Southern Africa, across South Asia, they're, they're bearing very similar stories across the board. And I, I'm incredibly proud to be, to be a part of that community uh, because that's, that's when I think the true colors show.
I mean, and, and Safi actually is one of the founders of, of one of those enterprises that, that remains a WFTO member, but also has worked with businesses like that for, for years. So, you know, Safi, I mean, perhaps you can also shed some light on this and, and see where those contrasts are with, with mainstream business who, who currently, the majority, are not demonstrating that kind of behaviour. Well, I, I, yeah, thank you, um, Erin. I, I think with, um, with, with PeopleTree, we found, um, obviously, the, the, the coronavirus has, has affected our, our, our customers and our business um, quite profoundly. Um, and of course, our, our producer partners um, are, are, you know, in a, in a deep state of, of, of having to, to, to find ways to uh, support their businesses whilst the social distancing and, and supplied, supplying relief work. Um, but I, I just, just really, I think just going back to this point around um, business transparency and the need for that core mission um, that, that puts, um, you know, I, well, I mean, let, let's just kind of step back just for a moment, because I think this, the, the growth of these uh, zoonic diseases actually shows how we have overstepped, overshot our planetary boundaries. And, and, and what I'm, I'm sensing, you know, alongside the absolute calamity of of the pandemic and the and the suffering where people have to choose whether they they choose their lives or or, or choose their livelihoods which actually means that their, their life indeed um where the the principles of fair trade which have always been about uh, people planet and prosperity um it is coming to the business world and um i'm i'm really delighted that uh, the, the, the 10 fair trade principles that, of course, um, you know, very much built um, and strengthened and applied and piloted. So these are not just, you know, sky in the, uh, you know, pie in the sky principles, but you know, totally applicable on the ground, um, working with some of the most economically marginalized, creative, brilliant uh, communities that we have throughout the, the global south. Um, so really delighted to see that, the, that these, these can be now, you know, as we've seen with uh, large corporations taking part of the sustainable development goals, which of course came from the Millennium Development Goals, but taking you know, three or four, um, uh, you know, actually understanding now that most of their operations will in fact impact the full 17. Um, and I think to your point, you know, we, we're, we're now looking at um, not only um, you know, the UN, um, Club of Rome, business leaders, I'm very involved with business declares a climate and ecological and social emergency, um, looking at uh, the investor community that are really looking at how um, investment and business can be a tool for change because, you know, we know that most of the SDG, uh, sorry, sorry, I beg your pardon, um, most of the um, supposed um, ESG, so the, uh, the environment, social and government um, focused investment actually um, hasn't been rigorous enough. Um, there's been a lot of greenwash and, and we need new financial tools. We need, need new business tools um, to truly deliver the change. And this, this will only come through better transparency. And here on Labor Day, you know, this is totally about um, delivering decent livelihoods, decent pay, um, safe working conditions at the same time, you know, being absolutely sure that there is a long-termism and it's that long-termism that I think um, the, the the principles of fair trade have spoken so deeply to. It's the long-termism um, that, that Celine talks to when she talks about um, making decisions that are about the workers and, and, and how um, she comes back to the buyers. Um, and I think, you know, talking, we'll talk a little bit more about design and I know um, my colleague Nolani has, has a lot of experience in, in eco-design, you know, we know that when we're choosing as buyers or designers uh, to work with a hand-woven fabric, um, that we'll need to, to tailor it slightly differently. We know when we're buying accessories, whether it's the commodity of the organic cotton or um, the Corozo button or the shell button or, um, you know, we, we know how to deal with the details. So I'm just asking, you know, let's let's take that into the, the entirety of, of our business planning and of our supply chain management, because only through that can we deliver true sustainability and fair trade um, through, through our business models. And I think, yeah, 
fair trade does a fantastic example of that lanali maybe you could talk a little bit also to share your experience of um designing to really put social impact and um, and, and zero zero carbon and climate central. Yes, yeah, so um, I love to do this, putting my changing my hat to a designer to consumer. Uh, so we've just had the fashion revolution week last week, and la uh, we've been asking the question of who made our clothes for about a good seven years, and it's something that as consumers we need to ask what we really need to have that transparency. But uh, at the same time. I think we've also started asking the question of what is in our clothes. So there's two perspectives, what who make it and what is in it. It's very important as a consumer and putting my designer hat, I think it's our responsibility as a designer because it's us who's starting the process, right? Um, if we can actually imagine a, a product being in a consumer's hand in the best possible way that Helps the planet and people, right? That's I think uh, I think I'm, I I think the designer has a huge responsibility in starting the whole life cycle of a product um, uh, that has transparency, better uh, material in uh, the product. Uh, I mean, it should be a nice ending story, right? It's not. Uh, it's in it's in our hands. So I think I love changing my hats always as a consumer and a and a designer. See how this these two uh, how do I look at it? So um, I think when you start as a designer, I think it's important to see uh, what environment we have, what we need to support, who's there, what skill is out there. Uh, then the other hand, what material we have. Like for example, Celine. I've been working working with Celine. Uh, a nice combination. Uh, we have the skill, it's a traditional craft in Sri Lanka, and we have uh, the material making in Sri Lanka where, where we, otherwise we have to export uh, most of the textiles. So it, it helps each other. So I think in a designer, I think there's a huge responsibility that uh, plays in designer's hand. And um, that's how I see, and I, I'm mainly in a later stage because what I do is upcycling. I come in as end of the uh, use or when it, the waste is there, only I play a role. But I think other than sustainability is not just being yourself in one corner of upcycling or, or, or in a fair trade. You try to as much implement as much as possible good things in, in maybe uh, the social and the planet or, or the environment, what can you bring in? What is the best that you can bring into code? So that's how I see as a designer, which I always change my head to consumer perspective as well. Vikum, I think we are back to you. Uh, I think if when you talk about the design, Vikum's uh, bags also implement a lot of design and, and the uh, um, raw material, which is coming from local. So I think as designers, we should start looking at sourcing stuff like local material. Absolutely. I mean, um, just also to the point that um, um, uh, Safia brought up about the, the, the rise of the zoonotic diseases, because I think over the last two decades, um, I think there was a 2016 report by the UN Environment Agency, uh, which said that it's, it's like growing at, um, at a rate that's going to be pretty unbearable. Um, and I mean, for us at Cantilla, transparency also meant being transparent in terms of our product, what goes into the product. Uh, so, I mean, if you just look at some of our website or the material from like the very plant that the materials are sourced from, uh, to how it's cleaned, how the fibers are extracted, uh, dyed, like everything is, that's, that's the transparency we want to give. Because um, it's, it's also a feeling that I mean, I, if I put myself uh, in the shoes as a consumer and I go to a shop um, and if I can find or I go online to buy something, if I can find more information about what's really in this product, its impact, how it's helping, I feel that I myself, uh, through that, tra that, that the transparency of that information, feel... Uh, uh, I, I feel more compelled or I, I feel like, yes, this is the product that I want to buy because I feel good that I'm not leaving a scar on this planet. Uh, I'm not breaking down the ecological barriers. And 
it's I think I think um, in, in terms of transparency is to a certain degree I feel that if you need to it's it's not it should not be a business consideration for you or for anyone. Uh, it needs to be something that you inculcate as a value of your own. Um, and when that when 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 it's a value for you, when it's something that you live by, um, it becomes much more easier. It becomes much more convenient to apply it. Um, and and there is also there's also the uh, there's the question. Okay, now it's COVID. We have to cut our costs. We need to look after our cash. Um, the, and so because of that, maybe we have to uh, use materials. That's it. And I think that's 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 the very that's that's a very old school, the the the, the method of doing business that has been proven wrong. Uh, it's it's never because when it's a value, it's 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 beyond the consideration of money. It's it's something that's very uh, that's very you feel strongly about. That's part of your brand. That's part of who you are. It's a part of what you do. The, the it's part of how you live, how you work. Um, so I mean, for us, that's always been the case. And um, even though we are very keen to continue showing the transparency, we had Fashion Revolution Week last week, um, and we ran a few you know, like Instagram stories showing who our artisans are. Uh, video clips of how they work on the looms, how the fiber is extracted. Um, and I think for all of us in the social enterprise, the fair trade community, we need to, at a very greater degree, and uh, using whatever platforms are available, really drive that transparency to the market. Um, that's, I think, how we can want separate ourselves from the, the the elements in the markets who want to kind of greenwash themselves uh, because that I mean greenwashing is essentially when you want to do this for financial considerations because the moment the finances don't look rosy people are going to really let it go and they're going to revert to business as usual and uh, yeah so I mean any, the community of you? have a, a really really beautiful product and I, I think it's um as the Marie Claire editor um, in Japan said, you know, she, very much this, it, fair trade craft product is, is very often eco lux. You know, it's a beautiful, it's, it's a real luxury. It's the luxury of uh, the, the knowledge that uh, by buying the product, you have a beautifully designed high quality product that is made of natural materials that has supported the artisan as opposed to detracted from the, their, their dignity of, of, of life. I have one of your bags and I, and I adore using it. Um, but I, I'm just kind of looking at the, the chat and um, I, I'm, I'm seeing that people have been, they, they started their morning with, uh, with uh, fair trade coffee, with, with homemade uh, uh, tomato juice, people are wearing patchwork clothing. Um, I'm, I'm head to toe, not surprisingly, in fair trade organic cotton, um, people tree, um, wearing my vintage birthday watch, um, which means it's really old. Um, and uh, you know, and, and I think, you know, th th so there's this kind of sense, isn't there, of kind of wanting to live our values, but at the same time, having to recognize that, you know, um, we, we are being on this call, by virtue of being on this call, we are you know, the privileged minority, we have a roof over our head, we probably have, you know, enough food in the, in the fridge or um, available to us, um, and that there are genuinely people who are economically struggling um, to make ends meet, people of have lost their jobs if you're self-employed even in the UK you have pretty much no income um, you have to think about going and living with your parents again or, or so, so you know so I think there is a kind of a genuine concern I have of you know the the struggle now that faces the supply chain where prices will increase and the increase of of a handwoven the, the price increase of a handwoven dress may well um, mean that it that it that it goes up a bit or the handwoven uh, bag product goes up a bit um and i think you know certainly from from my sense sitting here in in europe is that people are using this time if they can if they're not working i know some people are working you know twice as as, as busily as they as they were but those who, who are not are using this time to really you know do some some deep um reflection um some real thinking about purpose um, you know, at the same time, they're doing practical things like um, you know, going through their, their wardrobes and their things and really reassessing their relationship with stuff. 
um, and you know, detoxing their wardrobe and, and, and understanding that actually, you know, there's, if, if they're going to buy new, then, and of course there is always the, the, the choice of secondhand and vintage. If they're going to buy new, it needs to be ethical. It needs to be fairly traded. Ideally, it goes that one step up um, and it's, it's hand woven, hand knitted um, in, in such a way that it creates as much social impact as possible. Um, but I, I'm just, I'm just kind of, I'm really wondering because I know, Erinch, you know, looking, you, you have this, this bird's eye view of what's happening in the Welfare Trade Organization member partners, of which there are more than 300. So globally, um, I know you've set up the shop to support their trade producers, but I'm really keen to know, you know, what, what, what can we do? Because by promoting, by, by supporting their products right now, well, I, it feels to me, certainly from, from the emails I'm getting from producer partners, that there's a lot of struggle out there. There's a lot of grief. Um, and we need to do something. If we're in a position to help, we need to do something, as well as you know, looking at our businesses and how we do that job of running our businesses better. But can I ask you to tell us what you notice from fair trade organisations? Sure. I mean, firstly, I mean, we, we've got uh, World Fair Trade Day coming up, which uh, Safia, you're, it's, it's in your DNA and you're, you're a core part of it. It's uh, a pioneering day. So it, it's coming up Saturday next week on the 9th of May. Um, it's, and we've really um, thought deep and hard about how that day should work because we are in pain. I think as, as a movement, as a network of of you know fully committed pioneering fair trade enterprises we're, we're currently suffering pain as uh, you know th these aren't the enterprises that sort of uh, cruelly cut costs when things get tough they they stick with their communities and people and that means that you know when, when there is an income coming in life is difficult um but at the same time there is a lot to celebrate there's a you know, we, we, we will celebrate their solidarity. We will celebrate their, um, their, their visionary spirit and their, their pioneering work and their commitment and resilience in, in tough times. What we're asking people to do is uh, actually all the information can be found on the WFTO website. So WFTO.com forward slash Fair Trade Day 2020. I'll post a link into the group chat as well. Um, we're asking them to help spread the word about what, what it means to be a fair trade enterprise. So we've created, for instance, loads of uh, stories that are, that are coming up, but we, what we need is people to reach their networks. If every person can reach 50 or 100 people and they reach people and they reach people and we really amplify the voice of the authenticity of what, what happens in this community of enterprises, it makes a real difference because they're all set up to benefit the exact people who are suffering most at the moment. The people you were talking about, Safia, who, who maybe are in countries where there isn't a safety net, people, people who aren't going to have other livelihood options, people who don't have a stack of cash on the side that they can rely on when things get tough. They, they rely on this enterprise, which relies on the sales and the orders, which relies on people understanding why this is a meaningful thing to do. I mean, the thing that that sometimes concerns me is is the rise of greenwashing is the uh you know the, the, some some brands and i've worked in big companies as well as uh in the ngo sector uh you know the, the the rise of of the marketing opportunity of of uh appropriating some of this language and these stories which then makes it look like it's a wash well you know this company does something good as well in some project somewhere and that one's a fair trade enterprise that seems like that does something good okay there are two good things we'll just go with whatever and, and that sort of false uh, equivalence, I think, between what's happening, uh, you know, in, diff in different product supply chains is something we, we need to break and really demonstrate that there's, there's uh, a very uniquely, uh, you know, beneficial way that fair trade enterprises are working and other social enterprises are working. And uh, so I, I, would, I would encourage people to go to the, the website, which, which gives you loads of information about how you can promote it. Um, as I said, the, the web shops is a quite a big, big part of it. We now have more than a hundred of the fair trade enterprise members across the world who are, um, you know, making their products available online through web shops. And we're hoping to, to have that promotion increase. We need to, we need to pull those orders in at the moment to, to get the, those livelihoods um, consolidated. And then uh, also a lot of our members have set up crowdfunding um, and, and we'll be setting one up as well to do activities to support them too. So, uh, so those are the three actions that are at the top of the page for World Fair Trade Day. But the, the thing I would sort of go back to is 
um, the people and planet mantra. When we started planning World Fair Trade Day about a year ago, what we really wanted to do was to talk about a planet full of fair trade and a fair trade that looks after planet. So that's why the hashtag was planet fair trade. And that was, that's been in, in the plans for about a year now. Um, there's been this whole groundswell of support and commitment for um, you know, bringing environmental issues alongside fair trade and social issues and, uh, and, and having them coexist in a, in a sort of strong way. Uh, and we're starting to see that whether it's, you know, people that, that Vikram uh, and, and Lonali and, and Selena know quite well in, in Sri Lanka, like rice and curry, for instance, who are recycling plastic and turning them into new products. Uh, it's, it's a WFDO member there or Plastics for Change in India, which works with plastic waste pickers in order to create you know, uh, recycled products or Chaco in Tanzania, which, which cleans up the beaches and turns them into, uh, t- turns uh, waste into new products that ba- on fair trade terms. Um, or, or ones like Prokriti, which you know quite well, Safia, in, in uh, Bangladesh, which is currently taking the waste from the fast fashion factories and turning them into new products. And all those decisions are made because, you know, when I talk to the people, uh, when I talk to, to Suleiman in, in Chaco from Zanzibar, he would tell me the way we came up with the idea is our, our workers were telling us there's too much rubbish from the tourism industry on the beaches of Zanzibar. Our kids need to play. They can't get to work. So we thought, let's fix that problem. Let's clean that up. Can we turn that into a problem? Like the starting point was, let's fix the problem. Same thing with, with, with Bangladesh, you know, with Prakriti and others there that are taking the water hyacinth, which is blocking the waterways and turning them into, and using that to create products, using that as a, as a material for new products because they wanted to clean up the waterways. Like that was a starting point of Prakriti's business model for that product. Same with taking the waste from the fast fashion factories. I mean, what a wonderful metaphor for what we're trying to do as a movement is we're cleaning up the waste that is created in, in other parts of the economy that is less mindful of these things and turning it into new products that cleans things up as well as creates livelihoods and supports the values of fair trade. So, I mean, I, I, that was a starting point and World Fair Trade Day is going to be a bit of a consolidation of the two. It's going to be about fair trade solidarity in this time of hardship and need, but also resilience and strong will. And the other side, a vision of a planet fair trade, where we, these are the business models of the new economy. These are the business models of an economy we must create as the pandemic rolls out. So I, I, I am hopeful, but I, I invite everyone to go to the, the World Fair Trade Day website, which I'm about to post onto, uh, onto the chat box right now. So uh, you, hopefully you'll all click through, help us spread the word and take some of the actions that, that we're promoting through World Fair Trade Day on Saturday, the 9th of May. I mean, Vikram, Selena, Lanali, you guys have seen some of the work that's going on, for instance, the rice and curry work and others who are doing that kind of work. I mean, what, how have you seen that progress, particularly in this sort of pa- pandemic? Yeah, and, uh, thanks for that, Arinj. I think what you and Seth said and some of uh, two of the questions that have popped up here as well really talks of, um, if I can read it, how do you manage uh, a lack of raw material at this time, uh, you know? Uh, that kind of thinking and also how do you really market what we've been talking about for so long because that has become relevant in today's world and so if I take the the raw material side of things and really building on what you both said as well right now even to package the people's masks we are having to use plastic we are having to use polypack because for safety reasons right Um, the customer just don't doesn't want to get a um, kind of a, a mask which is for their health uh, in a paper pack so these so that that I see is a problem um, raw material uh, for some businesses to survive we are going to now for example my company depends on cotton yarn um, so if the if, if the flow stops what do I do if my, uh, if my fair trade certified cotton can't come to me, what do I do? You know, so these are questions that I've been thinking from the supply side. And I, th- I feel there's a huge gap also in our kind of um, network is to start creating the ecosystem and the supply chains necessary to support other business as well. And it has to be price competitive to a certain extent as well. Because especially in this post-COVID, I mean, what the post-COVID situation has brought to us is an opportunity for our products to go mass market. 
there are certain particularities in a mass market that we are going to have to deal with. So it's like I said in my first example, if you make the decision that no, your product will always be of the values you believe in and you're not going to um, go into the mass market compromising on those values, here's when you start creating and understanding how you can cater to that mass market demand, which will surely come. I don't have the answers to it, but these are observations that I have made during this period as to some bad practices that could come into our chains simply because we have to meet a mass market demand. So just putting it out there and just, just highlighting that there is need for rethinking. I'm not looking for answers particularly, but there is a need for rethinking. And also the marketing side of it, Erin. I mean, we are still using Facebook and Instagram products of an extremely capitalistic system to promote our products. Of course, we need to use that kind of platforms, but I feel that there is again an opportunity to completely change the way we market. Uh, completely, I don't know the answers, you know, I'm hoping by the end of this lockdown, some, some idea could have come into my but I mean, there's some in Sri Lanka, Ananta Sustainables, they use, uh, they produce paper packaging. Uh, they invest their entire marketing budget into community activities, into plugging, into beach cleanups, all of that. I mean, I, I can understand that some of these people, um, because it is a niche product, some of the people involved in these community activities are also our customers. But I feel as fair traders, we need to push our boundaries, you know, and really start addressing these two gaps which have come about very uh, strongly i feel in this uh, post covid situation and i think lonali you can also add a lot into maybe the into these two points basically yeah the question of having low uh, raw material right i mean my main raw material is based and right now all the factories most of the factories have been closed so therefore the base is zero so the question of me, I was actually thinking a lot, but then now I happen to be a, a quite happy person because my vision was to make it zero. So at least for a month, the waste was zero. So I think it's, it, I mean, as, as business people, the main thing is you should have that vision and you should stay, stick to it rather than trying to diversify in a situation like this. Um, and, and, be unhappy in a way in a way i'm really happy but I'm, i know that the factories are going to start there will be raw material coming in um so so you have to kind of go in depth to what you really believe in and then adjust to it so um so right now we have no raw material coming in as waste but the best is uh, it gives you uh, time to identify your competencies your values so what I take out is my value of upcycling, the, the process we do, the brand we build. I think what I have right now is that. So how do I model, like shape, reshape my business with my competencies, my values that I built? So that is how I look. I mean, I'm still looking for a lot of answers as well. Um, I mean, I know for a fact factories will open. There will be waste, some sort of waste coming in but I hope it will minimize in the future because that's, that is my vision. Um, but uh, how do I take my competency and, and reshape it to what the waste is? Probably, I mean, right now I know a lot of plastics being used. So can, we, can I use uh, the, the knowledge we have in upcycling or combining skill and techniques together and make use of the plastics that being used like so much at the moment? So that's, that's, uh, I think it's it's a good time to kind of reflect on your 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 values and competencies so that you reshape your businesses. But I'm also still looking for a lot of solutions like Selena. That was the question. Yeah. So did Erich want to add something? No, I was going to. I, I, I saw Eve's question, which I was uh, kind of in a roundabout way trying to to also address about how do we how do we explain the difference between uh, th those all enterprises that have gone through that whole, um, you know, deep uh, analysis and system and, and verification process of, of, for instance, the welfare trade organization and those that make 
self claims about, about things who may or may not be doing stuff, but it's, it's, it's harder to sort of uh, verify. And, uh, and I think it comes down to figuring out in different markets, what language the consumers in the market is using. I think what we've been guilty of sometimes as a movement is um, wanting to educate people about our language and, and it's just, people just don't have the attention span at the moment. I mean, I, I think we've got to get creative in using new language that, that, mean something to them right now and uh and rather than expecting that they will invest consumers will invest time into into understanding our, our language we have to do that in a way that distinguishes us i think uh, that doesn't uh just make it look like we're the same as any you know flash marketing approach of of, of any regular brand but but i think our big challenge is to meet consumers and and buyers where they're currently at um, rather than expect them to come to us. Um, these are all easy things to say and hard things to do. And I know that Selena, when we did the um, Instagram live a few weeks ago, you were talking about this as well, that, you know, you're, you're, you're beginning to talk to commercial buyers. I know that you've got, when we, when we were together in Frankfurt in February, we were talking about different buyers and markets that, that you and your business is going into. Um, and it sounds like that's, that's the trend. We've got to step into a different, different ball game and, and be able to distinguish ourselves and, and compete in that ball game. And that requires different language and different techniques. Um, actually, in uh, Sri Lanka, we are having this movement called Co-Create Tomorrow. Um, so it's a group of social enterprises and uh, ethical business and fair trade business really meeting together to understand how we can really co-create the way things are because we need to do two things at this point. We need to get mainstream business to subscribe to the values that we are, do we are subscribing to because this is a moment in our history that it has come to the attention of mainstream business that business as usual can no longer go ahead. And I feel that demand from the consumer for that will also come in. So I think we in the middle as thought leaders almost, we need to be in two sides, you know, how do we bring mainstream business to the middle and how do we help the fair traders to survive this, to pivot, to diversify their products without succumbing to the mass, you know, without succumbing because finally, um, if survival is the question, there is the human tendency to, to survive, right, at any cost. So I think there's a middle ground as we people in the middle, we really need to bring these two um, kind of actors together. Vikum, what do you think? Saf, uh, you, you were actually, yeah, earnestly actually, listening. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I was going to ask as uh, I was looking at the, the people tree story because where it originated in Japan. And I remember you once saying that uh, back then, the, 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 the community, the market in Japan was very materialistic driven. It did have much of a thought process around considering the values, the transparency. Uh, in, 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 in that like I think I think there are similarities between how you addressed the market in Japan back then and getting them on board with something like People Tree. What what is that we can Safia learn from your experience from that to kind of have changed the narrative now? Yeah. Um so yeah, I think I think collaboration uh, or co-creation as, as as you quite rightly described it is is a real opportunity because you know, let, let's just imagine that the 360 WFTO member organizations were to find commercial corporate partners in, in the next, you know, month or two. Um, what, what, could, what could they offer to that corporation? Well, you know, if, they, if they fitted in, in in some way to the product offer of that corporation, um, but, but with the, 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 the strength and the confidence and the assurance to say, you know, we need... Uh, a long-term partnership and this is what we would do at people tree we would say you know we're working with a, a major fashion brand or we're working with a major fashion retailer and we would say you know this is how it has to work such that we don't have to put pressure on our artisans um we need to, for example to to buy cotton at this point of the year for this order of you know ten thousand pieces for example um so really making very clear the stipulations of the terms of trade and the relationship, um, you know, right, right down to, of course, you know, the critical path, the timing, you know, how the brand is used, what the messaging is used, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, you know, starting People Tree in Japan meant that we had a really good opportunity to cut our teeth because if, 
if the product didn't meet in terms of the quality and the aesthetic aspiration of the consumer, of, 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 of the person who bought it, then it just wouldn't sell. So, you know, and I, and I think, you know, we, we've all learned that as a fair trade community over the last 20 years, you know, we have to make product that is beautiful and, and, and that, that, that works, that is, is made to a high standard. But I would personally, I would like to see corporations benefit from a partnership with a fair trade organization that would teach them um, about some of those intrinsic core values around um, paying a living wage, um, working with, with, with crafts or natural materials, you know, the, the, the terms of trade that they would then bring back into their own supply chain, what transparency means, what, you know, working with a share, uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, um, with a stakeholder first, as opposed to a shareholder, you know, front of mind. So I think the fair trade community has a huge amount to share with corporations. And um, Seth, if I can mention, I think Erin, you reminded me of this uh, at the press conference we had in Ambiente, our label. You know, I mean, the, my experience working with commercial buyers is that they are now looking at us as stakeholders, as you said, Seth, because they are also interested, because their current customer is demanding this. I, I mean, we can be used as greenwash if you are not careful. But the label means that the commercial customers have to show us. They have to be transparent with um, their suppliers, right? So I think there's a huge benefit in that. Again, the challenge is for us not to be used as their only fair trade uh, uh, kind of product <laughs> in their entire line, right? And I think Eve has also said um, from, I think, Fair Trade Scotland, it's, it's how do you educate the buyers? Yes, the buyers will be the key to all of this. Uh, today I wrote somewhere in some article that the, it, there's a huge um, responsibility on the part of the buyers to, and the consumers to say, look, we demand things that are ethical, sustainable. Um, but Saf, Erin, I mean, everyone, I mean, how do, because how do we do it? Marketing costs so much money, which is why I said in the beginning, should we really rethink and create this alternative way of showing impact almost. And that impact will speak for itself. The communities will speak for itself. Those organic stories will resonate through BBC and National Geographic. And you know, all these other mediums which have a bigger mass. You know what I'm trying to say, right? I'm trying, really trying to think about this because the biggest question for challenge for us fair traders especially in the global south is money for marketing our brands can't reach a bigger audience we simply don't have the networks or the funds to you know get I mean, out I mean, there I mean, something so, something that we've uh, i've tried is because uh, there was a period of time where we tried all the facebook marketing only to find out that someone else is bidding three dollars a click where we could only offer afford to maybe bid about half half a dollar to uh, do the same thing. But something I mean, uh, one one experience that I that worked for us was we tapped to some of the Sri Lankan communities in other countries and who subscribe to uh, who who love traditional crafts, uh, who subscribe to the values that we. Uh, we also live by, we work by, and we kind of got them to be uh, advocates, speakers for us in their communities. Uh, and I mean, it's 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 not, it's it's definitely not going to have like that huge sun uh, growth in sales reception that you would get from like a mass media, social media kind of uh, uh, activity. But in, in certain ways, it also helped us to scale gradually the business, our work, without suddenly building something too big that is unsustainable. And also then when something, when business has a downturn, being left with this large fixed cost that we can't deal with. Uh, it's, I mean, I, 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 yeah. another thing could be to think of ourselves as a movement and really galvanize a movement there are 2000 fair trade towns around the world you know there are tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people in universities in in towns community centers etc who are willing to 
promote fair trade products. Um, there are government bodies that have committed to procure fair trade products. You know, there's a, I think that's where some of our advantage is because of our authenticity as a movement. And I know the social enterprise community is beginning to, to go down a very similar route with the buy social campaigns and, and social enterprise towns and community groups, et cetera, that are arising. Um, I, th I think, you know, it's that dual identity that we are a movement. We're also a network of businesses and enterprises. And I think that duality gives us a bit of a competitive edge if we can tap into it. And I think we, we haven't made enough use of it, certainly until now. Yeah, because something that we learned was more than us saying that, oh, we are transparent, we are good, et cetera, et cetera. When a person hears that same message from someone they already know, someone they trust, um, it, it, they, they, they take it up much faster and we've actually seen like uh, the sale per, uh, through those kind of advocacy networks, the, the sale coming from those is much greater than what we get from our social media promotions. Yeah, um, so um, I think, yeah, I mean, I mean uh, just to add sort of like Eve's uh, question to what uh, allude, uh, Salid also alluded before, I think we really, as uh, Erich, uh, like we all said, I mean, we have our networks, and we the, the networks that solid in value, in principles, in transparency, and we need to be out there speaking on each other's behalf as well. That's that's something I very strongly believe. Like I mean, Selina and myself, Lenali, the three of us, we always speak on each other's behalf, and I'm like trying to push Selina's products. Selina helps me. Lenali and us also do the same. Uh, so I think maybe a, an actionable takeaway for all of us possibly today is uh, that let's leverage on our networks. Uh, it can be the fair trade network, the social enterprise networks, uh, expand the conversation, uh, really be on the ground. And I mean, just like that, I, I mean, if, if you kind of learned any to all the listeners today, if, if you kind of been inspired by something to take action, any actionable outcome from this, please do share with us on the chat. We'd really like to hear uh, what, uh, what you would take away from this conversation and kind of implement. Um, so we have, uh, we are nearly at the end. We'll take maybe another five, 10 minutes for a few closing remarks. So uh, Safia, if you would like to uh, share some thoughts uh, before we wrap it up. Yes, I think with World Fair Trade Day next Saturday, um, really building on what Erin uh, said, this, this sense of the grassroots community that touches so many different parts of our lives, wherever we are in the world. Um, absolutely, I'm, I'm so excited to, to see how it's pushed out. Um, and really, you know, we, we need to, to continue to build on that. Um, the fair trade products are just so much more beautiful, more tasty um, than they were, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, wouldn't it be great to have, you know, WFTO, uh, you know, ambassadors at, you know, street markets selling the best of the products, you know, and, and, and raising awareness of, uh, of the whole movement and all the brands that are part of the network. So I didn't mean to give you more work there. Um, but, but, but also, secondly, to totally realise that, um, you know, that we understand now that we need a more equitable economy and that the whole of the mainstream, whether we're talking about the business community, government or institutions, international institutions, the fact that large corporations are dodging their taxes, um, that you know, CEOs of, of main businesses, of mainstream business will, will have their pay packets um, you know, sculpted around delivering on social and ecological and climate goals you know this is things that we could only have dreamt of maybe two years ago and this is all coming front and center so i think also to for us as a movement to have more ambition about craft because craft is carbon zero carbon neutral we're creating livelihoods in the most economically disadvantaged areas the global south has felt the brunt of this crisis and i think you know many of us in the, in, 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 a, in a privileged uh, part of um, you know, our, our own countries or, or parts of the world are realizing that it's just not good enough. We have to, we have to change the way that we, we live. We have to change the way that we trade. Um, the, the economic and the financial systems are catching up now slowly, um, but let's have ambition. You know, there's no reason at all why um, corporations uh, could not as part of their um, 
outdated CSR and their, their innovative move towards the new economy work with a, a leading fair trade organization member and learn and support them for, for three or five years. I, I really think we, we need to, to be ambitious here. Uh, Erich, anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think th there's, there's an opportunity in every crisis. I mean, it's a bit of a cliche to, that, that never waste a, a good crisis. But I think the opportunity here is when the world economy is shaken to be able to, to, to put up and highlight and profile an alternative that is more resilient, that is more embedded in its community, that does stand by its workers and it is International Labor Day. So I want to underline that point you know, that does share more value with the people who make things. I think that opportunity is something that we really cannot waste. Uh, I fully agree with, with Safia that, you know, there are opportunities for social enterprises and fair trade enterprises to work with some of the, the bigger brands sometimes and the bigger commercial buyers, but that's a huge spectrum. So we need to select the ones that are leaning much more in our direction and are willing to do those longer term partnerships and, and start to embrace some of those fair trade principles. Um, and that's really for, you know, the savviness of the business leaders in our community to make those decisions. That's not something that we as a World Fair Trade organization can, can do, but I think we, we rely on these, these business leaders to get us through the crisis and to um, take new opportunities on board as we pivot out. But yes, please do support World Fair Trade Day. Join, join that global chorus that, that we'll be calling for, for a Planet Fair Trade um, leading up to Saturday next week. Perfect. Uh, Lanali Salida, any things like you guys would like to add? Go ahead, Lanali. Uh, I think you are uh, so COVID has made us realize that caring about planet and people is even more essential than any, any, any time before. So I think uh, it's a good, good time for us to kind of reshape, rethink and start, uh, start uh, putting act together. So I think um, uh, there's so much to explore. Um, not, I'm not a very disappointed person. A lot of people are really like uh, uh, sad at this moment, but I think social enterprises are quite positive. I'm, I've been talking to a lot of people and I think we should be taking this positivity uh, ahead. Yeah. yeah, and yes, Vikum, just to wrap up, I think really inspired by not just this call, but all the conversations we've had with SAS, Arrange, the entire network, uh, and I mean, I think we as uh, Sri Lankan ethical based fair trade business, we are really uh, privileged to have you guys kind of mentor us through things, you know. And what I've realized is that, and I keep saying this over and over again, uh, collaboration is the new competition. There is no other way for this world to uh, go ahead, you know. And um, we, I'm quite excited because this idea is kind of taking form in my head. Um, we need to look both inward and outward um, because while we protect our own networks to pivot, to diversify, to remain in business, I think there's a huge opportunity, like I said before, I'm just summarizing it, to look at our, the bigger business, helping them also to pivot, to diversify and to subscribe to the values that we have for so long stuck by, you know, and, and it's paid off. I mean, I told my mom that I'll never disagree with her at all, <laughs> ever, because it's true that leadership came. I mean, I got scared personally. I'm being very, I, I got scared, you know, and I looked at uh, my first mind went to these traditional ways of doing business, of cutting down and all of that. But she said, no, absolutely not. And I think that is what we've done for so long. And it, pays off and this whole idea of marketing there's so many questions here about how do we push our message how people i think right at the end it says you know people are just interested for one week two weeks our world is so full of trends they forget and that is where i feel something that's worked for celine can work for the entire network and that is the power of our networks Saf, you would have never come to see us if vikum didn't talk about us to you you know what i mean right like we've, it's, I think there's this beautiful thing within our network, not just the 
fair traders in the world, fair uh, WFTO, but there's so many of us everywhere. We just need to start talking to each other just in a structured manner because we do have an ulterior motive in that sense to spread the values across, you know. If National Geography can talk about ocean waste and the different kind of companies that are, um, you know, working, I, I know I'm just thinking here, but I just feel that there's such a strong story to tell and we need to tell that story through our networks and people will listen because they're always out for a good story, right? Steph, uh, what do you think? I saw you putting a thumbs up. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, yeah, at, at everything you said. Um, sorry, I, I think I've had too much time. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, any, anything else you want to add, Saf? Please go ahead. Uh, but no, I I'm very much enjoyed speaking with you all today. And um, yeah, it's, it's been really, really exciting. I think, I think we, should, we should talk more in this kind of mix of uh, different experiences. Um, so yeah, really valuable conversation and a really inspiring way to to start my Friday and weekend. <laughs> Brilliant. Vikum, just before you wrap up, I want yeah. to tell everyone who's here, Vikum, Lonali and I tried this new way of doing Zoom calls. We <laughs> told Erin and Saf, like, okay, you know, let this not be a panel kind of discussion. Let's try to have a real conversation among ourselves. <laughs> I don't know what everyone who's come on board feels about it but this is really in the spirit of that co-creating tomorrow because there are there are things that we can all learn from each other and yeah I hope so to the audience who signed up you know thanks for like being our trial run <laughs> and uh, I hope please do give comments I mean on how we can uh, kind of develop this process and format as well because yeah. over to you Brilliant. thank you thank you so much everyone to our speakers and everybody who joined in and I mean, I'm, I'm really happy because uh, on the chat, there are a few people who not just asking questions, but giving their point of view, uh, their experience. I mean, that's always welcome. This is about sharing experiences, opinions, and that's very important because uh, all movements, everything that we do, we have to evolve. Uh, that's the problem with the capitalist model. It never evolved. It's become immune to questioning. So it's turned into this very destructive force to both the environment, the people, the communities. Um, so having these conversations is not just about the speakers, us kind of coming out with their experience and opinions, and we always welcome what you say. Uh, just one kind of closing remark note that I would leave is, yes, trends come and go. But one trend will always remain is humanity. Uh, and uh, more than ever, the importance of humanity has been highlighted within the last several months. Um, and if we, if we base our work, uh, our, our principles, uh, and kind of going to the market, talking about what we do is based on the message of humanity, uh, being one with nature, being part of nature, just like the, the fair trip is of, about being concerned for the people and the planet. Uh, I think uh, we will definitely outlive uh, the large corporations who are very narrow-minded and who only think about themselves. So thank you so much. We will have the conversation. It's on record. We will have it online. We will share it with everyone via email, the link to everyone who signed up. Uh, and thank you so much. Wish you everyone a good Friday and a good weekend ahead. Uh, and we will hopefully be connect, uh, connected with you again. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.